Kenzie, we got Taylor on the line. What do you want to ask him? How would you structure a deal when you help someone else raise capital for their deal? It's very difficult to do in a legal and compliant manner. Mm -hmm. So the process that I went through is I got securities licenses and it took probably eight months or so to go through the whole process of taking the exams and getting everything in place and, you know, all the checks and everything we had to do. That's a, that's a difficult way to do it. And it's definitely a commitment to that process and that type of the business, because now my role is raising capital. I'm Brian Briscoe, host of the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast, and this podcast is different than everything else out there. I bring together a new and an experienced investor on each episode, and I let the aspiring investor ask the questions that they need answered. So if you're an aspiring investor yourself, you probably will have the exact same questions. Now, before we get to this episode, make sure you hit the subscribe button below and that little bell to make sure you get notified every time we post a new episode. And now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe with Streamline Capital. Very excited for today's show. We're talking with two great individuals today. We got Taylor Lote and Kenzie Barrett. Taylor, you're going to be up first today in the hot seat as our experienced investor. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to reconnect with you. The last time you and I spoke, you still lived on the East Coast. I feel like it's been a long time. So great to see you again. You know, it's been at least a year. I remember, you know, we were almost neighbors. I mean, you were Richmond and I was just north mm -hmm. of DC, close enough that we can just say neighbors. We were we were neighbors for all intents right. and purposes, the DMV area. So mm -hmm. um, it is really, really good to reconnect. Thanks for coming on the show today. Do, do us Thanks a favor and let everybody know a little bit about you. Tell us about yourself. Give us an idea of your background and how you got into multifamily. Sure, absolutely. So as you mentioned, a multifamily real estate investor. Background is, you know, I had been, I got out of college, started making big boy money, you know, I had an engineering degree yeah. and uh, decided, I realized, how do I turn this into more money? I mean, I always kind of wanted to do that. Picked up a book that some listeners might be familiar with, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. It's really more about publicly traded equities and value investing. And it's the the book and the mentality that inspired Warren Buffett. That got me into Wall Street type of investing. And I just so happened to time the market well by being lucky because I graduated from college in, in 2011. Now, you know, forever ago now. <laughs> yeah. Beginning but of it was, the bull market, right? So Absolutely. Kind of hard to go wrong as a stock investor at that point. Did that for a few years. And ultimately, I was doing the math, right? I'm a math guy. And I was seeing that this isn't going to take me in a direction that I want to go. This isn't going to get me where I want to be. Mm -hmm. Started looking for other options. I started a couple of years study period. At one point, I thought maybe I'll go get an MBA. Went pretty far down the path of that. Mm -hmm. But I'd have been listening to podcasts much like this one back in the day, and including Bigger Pockets and a few other real estate yeah. investing podcasts. They recommended Rich Dad Poor Dad. What do you know? I put I, I picked that book up. He taught me about the power of cash flow. Taught me that. Mm -hmm. All of my misgivings that I had about going and getting an MBA were right or probably right for me. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do across the board, but for, yeah. for me, it was the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Decided, hey, I'm going to get out of Wall Street and work on getting into Main Street and ultimately you know, landed on multifamily. Once I think you learn the benefits, the upsides of multifamily investing, especially large deals, when you're somebody who I like to think big and when you think big like me, just kind of pulls you in. So yeah. that's kind of the, how I got started. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I like a lot. Of, I mean, I too read rich dad, poor dad, you know, that was kind of a catalyst for me. And I think a lot of people, well, if people are listening to this podcast, they've probably listened to all the same podcasts that you and I both listen to as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, very, very nice. And, and once again, you know, congratulations on timing the market perfectly. <laughs> um, I graduated college in 99, right before the dot com bubble burst. So that was, uh, that was my, you know, intro to investing is just like, wow, everything just lost half of its value. There's a lot to do about timing. And that's, that's something that's, that's hard to, hard to really nail. So you start talking about getting into larger properties or large apartment complexes. What was going through your mind when you, when you made the transition, um, go, go a little deeper into what we were just talking about, you know, what was going through your mind and making that transition into the larger apartment complexes? Sure, absolutely. So really once I got into learning about real estate investing, you know, first when you 
when you read information that's written by Wall Street people about real estate investing, now I know that they get so much wrong. They have mm -hmm. basically no idea what they're talking about, about how actual successful real estate investing works. They really are familiar with, you buy the single family next door, you self-manage it, and what do you know? You make a pretty not yeah. great return at the end of the day, plus you spend all your time. Yeah. But or on you... the flip side, they're talking about REITs, which is completely yeah. different as well, which is like the other end of the spectrum. You know, they're 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 on one end of the spectrum or the other, and there's so much in between stuff. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry about that. No, 100%. You're totally right. They'll bring up REITs as a way to, you know, quote unquote, invest in real estate. People have different opinions about that. You get exposure to real estate, but it's really like owning a stock that, you know, pays a dividend and stuff. And they have rules around uh, REIT investing. But I started learning how money works in, in real estate investing. And that was by attending networking events and continuing to listen to podcasts, but really digging in, reading books, reading books about real estate finance and how it, how it works. I got one of my favorite books over on the bookshelf over there mm -hmm. uh, about projecting cash flows. Still, I was doing the math. I was learning about how flips work, but I was talking to flippers personally in person, going to networking events and mm -hmm. learning about themselves and their lives. And I, I saw that they hadn't created the lives for themselves that I wanted. And it's okay if they're if they're happy, that's their business. That's no problem. But I could see the results and it wasn't what I was aiming for. Mm -hmm. So again, I kept learning, kept learning. And I just so happened to meet multifamily investors who were focused on larger deals that had gotten out of the day-to-day -day operations of the properties and had mm -hmm. third-party property managers and didn't put up all the money to buy the deals. They raised the money from investors. And I saw the lifestyles that they were living. Now, this is not, I'm not saying Lambo, Rolls Royce, Bentley lifestyles. I'm saying they had earned passive income from their investments. They're not involved in the day-to-day -day management of the properties. Mm -hmm. And I was like, check, 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 check. I'm in. How do I do this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I went to a, a lot of the meetups in the, in the DC area and met a lot of people like that. And that's where I first started hearing your name. Now, now do you still <laughs> run your Richmond meetup? You had one in Richmond for a while, right? Yeah, so uh, we went online during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, here we are in the summer of 2022. We've been still doing some online. Mm -hmm. You don't quite get the same impact. I actually just had a meeting with another local investor last week and we're talking about bringing it back in person, um, but much bigger. So things are, things are in the works. If you're in the Richmond area, we're working on it. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's one that uh, I had, I think we connected right before the pandemic because I, I think I had committed to driving down to Richmond for your next meetup when we, when we talked and then, <laughs> you know, that evaporated just, you know, that quickly, but uh, sorry, man, um, you know, we'll, we'll blame somebody else, you know, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. So but cool. So now speaking of your meetup, you know, a lot of people, and this is a little bit off script, never, never really delved into this one before, but a lot of people have talked about, you know, starting meetups. Would you recommend that for a new syndicator or what, how about this? What value have you gotten as a meetup host in, in that capacity? Well, to address your first question, uh, yes, I would recommend it as long as you're going to commit to the process, then go for it. But realize that it's going to really not be good at the beginning. Some people aren't going to show up. You're going to be sitting in a, in a room with one other person yeah, and you're going to want to quit. Sorry. It's going to probably going to happen. It might not happen to you, but odds are probably pretty good. That's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, as far as, you know, value that I got, I made so many connections. Mm -hmm. I got investors out of it. It helped me build my brand. It's a commitment device like no other, because when you have, see, you got misgivings in your mind, limiting beliefs, whatever, and you think, ah, man, you know, I just, you know, it's not going right. It's not going the way I want. I want to quit. And then you get an email from somebody who attends your meetup asking about, you know, what's the speaker going to be next month? Because I really want to make sure I make it. And yeah. I want to just want to know what to expect. And you're like, all right, well, I got to keep going. And that really helps, especially in the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you're thinking about it, you're in the beginning, I say, just go for it. Realize that again, probably the odds that nobody shows up or one person shows up, a handful shows up at the beginning are pretty high and mm -hmm. that's okay. It's about how do you keep growing and moving forward with it? I love it. I love it. And I, I did do a virtual meetup. I was actually going to start one in Gaithersburg, which is where I was living. 
And it was supposed to, the first one was supposed to be April 17th. You know, I had everything set up. I had the speaker lined up. It was Michael Blanc, who also lived in Northern Virginia at the time. And, uh, you know, the, the pandemic kept me from having that three peer person, you know, three people show up. So um, ended up doing it uh, virtual. One thing that I noticed for me is I really had to commit to the, the self-identity of being an apartment investor before I launched that because I, I, it, was, it was one of those last steps in my mind to mentally bridge that gap between I am an apartment investor and whatever I was previously. Anyway, my two cents on, on the meetups. That said, let's get back to, to actual real estate. Let's talk about something, you know, one of the deals you've done, you know, pick your first or your favorite and, you know, tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about it. Sure. So uh, this deal is totally closed out. We sold it. Uh, we bought a property in Amarillo, Texas, as uh, a C-class apartment complex. Can't remember the year it was built, but it was, you know, fairly dated, um, 225 units. And this was a bit before the pandemic uh, mm-hmm. closed on the deal. And it just needed a pretty significant amount of work, you know, when we got into it, which is just kind of something that happens. I've learned with C-class properties that they have, you want to be prepared for the deferred maintenance, but it's almost always more than you expect to, you know, got to be well capitalized mm-hmm. and that kind of thing and, and really deal with it well operationally, which were you know hiccups that came up along the way. But we had a new, but great and highly motivated property management company, Mm -hmm. uh, did really quite a few asset management calls with them very consistently to make sure that they were staying on track. Um, that property, we held it through the pandemic, which was, you know, of course, you know, with the eviction moratorium and everything, there were, there were problems, right? You have folks that aren't paying. So we need our property managers to have great relationships with the tenants, which fortunately we did. We had a lady in the office who was really awesome, mm-hmm. uh, had great relationships with the tenants. And for our folks that are tenants that were experiencing, you know, unemployment related and, and employment related issues, we were able to work with, you know, local governments to get all of the, you know, various stimulus programs that were available to make sure that their rents were paid. Mm-hmm. And that we, you know, we wouldn't have issues uh, related to that. Ended up selling that property in, I believe that closed in September of 2021. Um, you know, really happy to be able to, you know, deliver for investors. There were so many lessons throughout that process that we learned. And um, yeah, it was a, just a great experience and, you know, glad it uh, worked out for everybody. Yeah. A, cu- a couple of points you made there that, uh, you know, remind me of our first investment. I mean, I, we, we bought our first in October, 2019 and, I don't think anybody planned for the pandemic, you know, in, in a lot of ways, but uh, you also mentioned, you know, a lot of, a lot of extra deferred maintenance that you didn't find. Um, how have you adjusted, you know, since that first property, when you underwrite for your, your CapEx budget? So now I focus on newer class mm-hmm. B properties. I mean, there's certain things that you, it's, it's that old Donald Rumsfeld, you, the unknown unknowns yes. aspect of it is like, I know, this property was built in the sixties, right? So mm-hmm. I can kind of take a guess, like we're going to have people go and look at the property in person, do that due diligence, you know, scope the lines, all those kinds of things to figure out what the issues are going to be. But I think there are just certain things that are unavoidable. Once a property gets to, you know, 50, 60 years old, mm-hmm. there's just stuff that's going to need to be done. If you can't see that it has been done, then you know, you can expect that to come up. So to me, the best thing to do rather than changing your, your underwriting and the way you do the math on it is just to change the type of asset that you invest in to, yeah. you know, hopefully avoid those issues. Oh, I like that idea. And I, I see, I see a lot of people do similar things. I think C-class value add is where most people start out with, mm-hmm. but I, I think what you see is a lot of people start graduating away from that, you know, or, or gradually moving towards the B class or the A class. But uh, I would say in general, C class value add is, is starting point for most people. Um, I like that answer. You know, it wasn't, uh, wasn't what I was thinking, but uh, yeah, the, the way you, uh, the way you adjust for it is you don't buy C class value adds anymore, but. Uh, well, right. And, and, you know, I stand by that. And I would also say that in the recent mm-hmm. market conditions over the last couple of years, cap rate rates in general have gotten so compressed Mm -hmm. that the premium for newer properties is not as significant as it used to be, right? The 
cheaper, older properties have been bid up so much that there's a lot less justification to buy an older property that needs more work because the the num the math just doesn't work yeah. out. There's not Numbers as much there. like risk premium, right? Yeah, I mean, you, a couple of years ago, and the the cap rate spread between A class and C class has compressed to where you're not getting that extra bump in or that that extra break in the purchase price because you have to do all that work. So it's yes, it's almost like you're doing a lot more work for for less returns. When I say almost, it really is. But uh, um, well, cool. So one thing I, I like to ask everybody on the podcast is, is about motivation. So what would you say your big burning why is? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think ultimately the goal is to live in abundance for yourself as much as mm -hmm. possible. But that's not, to me, that's not expansive enough. And my goal is to support causes that I care about. I'm a big time animal lover. I support, you know, animal, uh, shelters now actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I really just want to scale that up. I mean, the amount of, of support that I'm able to provide now is far short of what I want. I have a number in my head mm -hmm. of what I'd like to do over my lifetime, but if I can compress that time frame to, you know, a decade or so, then I'll be thrilled. And yeah. that's really what I want to do. I mean, years ago, it started out as, you know, I want to be able to support my parents in their old age. And I, I think, mm -hmm. They're not old. They're 60, right? They're, they're, they're going to be fine, but I, we're going to be fine. That's, that's yeah. going to be okay. I want to continue to expand and grow and let's support causes that I care about. Nice. Nice. I love that. I love that. Giving back is, has been something that's important for us too. And, you know, speaking of am, animal lovers, we just added an extra dog to the household nice. a week ago. So um, I'm good for that. So last question for you before we, we bring Kenzie on what's next. Continuing to grow, you know, mm -hmm. for me, a lot of what I do is just getting the word out there, teaching people, uh, continuing to, pr to provide that education. So I want to get more into publishing content on YouTube. I love YouTube as a, as a consumer. I get a lot of information mm -hmm. about YouTube. As a, as a note, recently, I've been kind of going down a rabbit hole of NFT and crypto scams. There were mm -hmm. so many. It's completely unbelievable the number of lies that these people were telling when they were selling these altcoins and these NFT projects. I can't even, I can't even fathom lying mm -hmm. to people the way that they were. So that's what I've been going. That's, that's kind of eating up my mind right now, putting out more content on YouTube. Like I mentioned before, I'm having uh, meetings with another local investor uh, about bringing our, our meetup back in person. I'm pretty excited about that. He's got some pretty ambitious goals and I'm right there with him. I've been wanting to get that going again. And um yeah, just continuing to grow, continuing to do deals. I think interest rates going up is going to generally across the market, mm -hmm. reduce the amount of deal flow in, in multifamily, but probably other asset classes too. And that's okay. We just, you know, want to be prepared when the deals resume, which will happen yeah. again someday. Yeah. I, I, I think the same thing we were, we've definitely seen a slowdown. We've seen fewer properties hit the market. We've seen fewer, um, fewer offers on the properties that are, and we've seen softening of prices in certain areas. Um, but I, I do agree that eventually, you know, the pendulum is going to shift the other way to where it's all going to be turned back on and it's going to be game on for everybody again. Anyway, that said, we're going to shift gears here and welcome Kenzie to the show. So Kenzie, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. So do us a favor, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I was born and raised in a small town in Costa Rica. I moved to the Garden State around the age of nine, and I've been here um, ever since. Um, like most people, my quest for financial freedom started um, after reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad um, in high school. Nice. Um, I currently own and operate um, a vending machine business. Mm -hmm. um, and I always knew that I wanted to own real estate. Um, real estate has been one of the best ways to accumulate wealth. Mm -hmm. but I just didn't know how to get started. So I attended um, a multifamily seminar around March, mm -hmm. um, which led me to join a mentorship program that introduced me to some really amazing people in this business. And every day I'm just soaking up as much information as I can about the multifamily business. Love it. Love it. So Costa Rica to Jersey and... Um age of nine. Okay. So I'm just, just trying to, you know, run things through my head. Um, 
I've heard this, and I think you're you're a perfect example of. I've heard if you learn learn a second language before you're ten, you don't speak with an accent. And I, when you said Costa Rica, that's what I started listening for. But anyway, accent free. So yeah. good job, I guess. <laughs> I get you, to turn it off and turn it on when I want to. Yeah, it's, man, I wish I could do that. Um, <laughs> I, I speak Spanish and Portuguese, and I've been to most countries, you know, in, I've been to most countries in the Western Hemisphere. Costa Rica is one I've actually missed, but I do not have the ability to flip a switch and, and switch between two languages, but uh, um, I wish I did. But anyway, um, so Venting Machine Company, tell us, tell us a little bit about, uh, about that. Um, yeah, so I started that my senior year of high school. Mm -hmm. I was um, pretty young. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really have a vehicle at the time. I had to use my mother's car. So um, other businesses also required a lot of capital. So I needed something that wasn't going to take too much of my time mm -hmm. um, while also still being able to focus on school. So I looked into the vending machine um, business and I was able to get my vending machine into a laundromat in a town next to mine. Um, and yeah, and, and I've been able to grow that now and create like a passive income for myself. Nice. I, something, the, part of the reason I asked about that is my, my dad had a vending machine business. I mean, he was, I think he had kind of the entrepreneurial spirit, but was, was addicted to the paycheck. So he, you know, never, never was able to really break away from that. But, uh, um, he ended up with, with several vending machines and, um, it was about the right, right about the time that I moved out of the house. But the, the benefit for my kids is every time they went to grandpa's house is he always, always, always had candy because, yeah. you know, he, he'd, he'd go to Costco, he'd have the, you know, he'd buy the M&Ms in bulk and everything else, but he'd always have the little treats for the kids. But uh, anyway, well, good on you for, for starting the, the vending machine business. Um, and, you know, whether it you know thrives or, or fails, it, it's a great thing for you. It's it's going to be experience and it's going to be um, it's going to be something that where you can just build on in the future. So um, anyway, that said, um, what's let's look into your motivation a little bit. Like I said, it's it's a question I always ask everybody, but what is your big burning why? Um, family, honestly, I think it's uh, the big burning why for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, my ultimate goal is to retire my mom and then, you know, go back home and share everything that I've learned in hopes of helping others create generational wealth for their families. Um, so family, I know it's a, it's a big thing for me and, and I, I'm sure it's a big thing for other people. So I want to be able to do that for my family as well as help others do that for their families. Love it. I love it. And, and most, most people come on this show, it's, it's, all, it's, it's about family or it's about giving back. That's, those are the common themes all across the board, you know, and I, I think that's uh, one thing that I really like about this industry is, is so many people are, are looking just to benefit other people. You know, there's, there's rarely somebody that comes on my podcast that says, you know, I want the Lamborghini or the Maserati or, you know, the, the gigantic house. It's, it's usually about family and it's usually right. about uh, giving back. So anyway, um, thanks to both of you for sharing, sharing your, your motivations with us today. Um, that said, Kenzie, we got Taylor on the line. What do you want to ask him? Yeah. So, hey, Taylor, how are you? Thank you What's so up? much for being here. Um, I know you touch based on, on capital and I um, I was wondering like how much capital should you raise for like unexpected deferred maintenance in C-class properties? Well, that's a good question. That's probably honestly too tough of a question for me. I don't know if I have a great answer for you. It's going to depend on the deal. I mean, what does it need, right? What is your your deferred maintenance that you can see? Um, I don't know that there is a hard and fast number, at least that, that I can think of. Maybe there are others that would be able to give you yeah. a hard and fast number, but I think you have to look at what you need and raise accordingly. Oftentimes C-class properties will have a pool that is just in severe disrepair. Maybe it's not being used. Maybe it is being used, but it needs work. Sometimes you might decide I need to fix it up or I need to fill it in to really improve the character of the property. Well, that needs to be baked into your underwriting. Does it have, does it need roofs? You need to know if you need, if you're going to need new roofs in the time that you mm -hmm. own the property. So you need to 
you need to know that. Some C-class properties, the roofs are ta already taken care of, so you might not need to do those. Mm -hmm. Other things might come up like uh, plumbing buried beneath mm -hmm. the foundation. You need to know those things. I looked at a property in 2018, I think it was. It might have even been 17. Uh, here in Richmond, it was uh, 30 units, give or take, and a slab foundation, mm -hmm. and it had uh, sunken. It had uh, sunken a couple inches, depending on where you were, sometimes a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I brought out a foundation expert to look at it and his guess about what it would have taken just to get the property lifted back up and even was around the $300,000 mark. Plus, they were going to have to build pilings and there's no telling what kind of plumbing you're going to break when you do that. He couldn't even really give me a number. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was, well, this is obviously not a deal, yeah. but I think that that speaks to the process that you need to implement to figure that out. Because somebody who I know did buy that deal, and I think they bought it in 2019 or so, and it worked out for them, but they made the numbers work. To me, the numbers mm -hmm. didn't work and they must have, you know, I don't know what exactly they did to figure that out. I don't know how they made the numbers work, but they yeah. made it happen. You know, I, I would just add to that, um, is, is not, it's not just a matter of money. You know, you definitely have to be capitalized to be able to do things, but have a kind of a priority of work, you know, have, have kind of like, these are, these are the things that we're going to make sure prioritize all of your capital expenses. And I I've talked with a lot of people. Most people don't want to say this while we're recording, but I've talked to a lot of people before <laughs> and after hitting the record button, but a lot of people who underwrote properties in 2019 ran out of money on their on their capital expenditures and it wasn't because of how good they were at underwriting it's because the price of materials and service have gone up by 20 to 30 percent all right so you know it didn't matter how well you underwrote your numbers in 2019 because inflation for the last 10 years has been about 10 percent so I, I would say one thing that you should always do is prioritize your capital expenditures and make sure the most important ones get done first and have a minimum amount that your capital expense account doesn't fall below that you can worry about, you know, those slab leaks, or you can worry about the air conditioners that go out or HVACs that come out. But there's, there's, it's more than just a number. It's also, how are you going to execute the business plan? And I think prioritizing, you know, what comes first and what can fall off your, your renovation list if you run out of money is is more important than the number on the spreadsheet. Great point. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, that's um, definitely something I will look into. Um, yeah. Guys, thank you guys. Um, and you guys also touched based on um, the slow market right now. Um, and what one thing I did um, notice um, for me is like some, I, I really don't want to get in the deal right now like my own deal, I want to help others uh, raise capital. So how would you structure a deal when you help someone else raise capital for their deal? I don't know if you have any experience in doing that. So for me, I'll jump on that. I, that's difficult. It's very difficult to do in a legal and compliant manner. Mm -hmm. So the process that I went through is I got securities licenses and it took probably eight months or so to go through the whole process of taking the exams and getting everything in place and, you know, all the checks and everything we had to do. That's a, that's a difficult way to do it. And it's definitely a commitment to that process and that type of the business, because now my role is raising capital for deals. I'm not out doing my own syndications and selling those securities to investors because I can't do that in a legal manner. The, the, the regulators say, I can't sell securities away from the supervision of my broker dealer. So that is a requirement for us. There are a lot of folks out there doing SPVs or their, their own funds, basically under syndications. Um, if I were to go that route, I would, you obviously need to speak with a, an attorney to, to structure that, but there are ways to do that legally. Um, so talk with an attorney, but that's probably the route I would go unless you're certain you want to go down the route of raising capital and getting, uh, getting securities licenses, then you know, go for it, but it's definitely a commitment to go this route. Yeah, it's it, it's a very tricky question to answer because there are a lot of laws. There's broker dealer laws. There's you know fund manager laws. There's um, SEC regulations. There, there's a lot of different things that you have to navigate to to raise capital. 
Um, and I, I, I would say, make sure that you understand no matter how you're coming into a deal, make sure you're compliant is, is the answer, you know? So um, if you're, if you're doing the SPV and I'm, I'm starting a fund right now, there's still compliance issues. There's added layer of compliance issues um, because in addition to being potentially a, a GP member and raising money for other people's deals, I'm also a fund manager. So there's, it's, it's really, it's really a matter of, you know, how you set it up. The answer is you get an attorney and you, you take the attorney's advice, you know, Hey, this is what I want to do. You know, is this legal? Am I compliant or how do I stay compliant? Okay. Got it. Yeah. Also, Tough question to answer really. Yeah. Um, I actually had no idea that um, you had to be licensed in order to raise capital for someone else. So that's definitely well, something. There, there are ways around it. I mean, let's see. So, so not to, not to get any, you know, people throwing stones. Um, you can't just raise capital is the answer unless you have your broker dealer licenses. All right. Mm -hmm. You have to do things besides just raising capital. And that's, that's the tricky part about it is, if you are a broker dealer, if you have your, your FINRA licenses like, like Taylor does, I mean, it makes things easier to do to just raise capital. I mean, am I, am I right, Taylor? I would say, yes, it makes it easier in that I know exactly the role that I can take in a deal. Mm -hmm. From the compliance side, there's a lot to do. In, and this is something that I've, I've told folks when I discuss this is, you know, getting these licenses, going through the process, taking the exams, and then also getting everything in place so that we can, you know, be compliant operationally. Honestly, it makes the SEC only regulated like syndication space, 506B and 506C, makes that look like the Wild West. Mm -hmm. The regulators, um, I think they're very interested in protecting investor interests and monitoring our behaviors, which is, you know, fine. I, mm -hmm. I work within that structure. But compared to like compared to what I'm what I'm doing now compared to you know five oh six B world, it's just uh it's completely different. It's been very uh very illuminating. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the day, if you're gonna bring capital to somebody else's deal, you know, make sure that there's an attorney involved in the transaction and make sure that you're talking with the attorney to maintain compliance. Hmm. Okay. An attorney yeah. experienced in the area is important. good good okay. qualification. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, um, what I've noticed, a lot of brokers are sending um, deals that um, sellers have like a bridge loan, I think it's what it's called. So what are your thoughts or experience with um, bridge loans? So I think that the situation right now is rates are going up. So if you're looking at a deal with an assumable loan, we'll just say in this case, it's an assumable loan with an attractive rate that you're not going to need to seek new debt in the next to put it, if I were to put a number on it in the next year to 18 months, I would consider that an interesting setup. Now you need to dig into the underwriting to figure out whether the numbers actually work. But right now, to my estimation, we're in an inter increasing interest rate uh, period in history. Uh, Brian and I, uh, we were talking about this before we started recording. I just recently uh, bought a new home for myself and, and my fiance and our rate, because we closed in Q2 of 2022, our rate was higher when we closed than when we started looking, which is at the very beginning of 2022. Mm -hmm. And there is a possibility that rates could be lower. It maybe you could refi in the 3% range in the future if rates come back down, but I, I don't want to bank on that. And I can't bank my personal finance strategy on that. I can't bake, bank my investment strategy on that. People got in trouble for assuming that, hey, I can just refinance in the build up to the great recession with all the balloon, you know, the, all the adjustable rate mortgages and everything that basically precipitated that event. So I think it's just important to be aware of what you're going into. If it has an attractive rate, then Hey, cheap debt is cheap debt, but be aware that in the next year, 18 months, I'm betting, I'm wagering that rates are going to be higher than, than they have been for say the last two years or so, maybe yeah. even longer. Yeah. And I, I tend to agree uh, a lot about loans and bridge loans. I would say the most important thing 
is the debt has to match the business plan. All right. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got to make sure that, I mean, a bridge loan is by nature a short term loan. It's supposed to bridge the gap between where you are now and when you can get permanent financing in like a 20, 25 or 30 year AM. That's what bridge loans were designed for. OK, so when you're looking at going into bridge loans, where does it make sense? Value adds in a lot of cases, you know, if you're going to do a value add where, you know, you're coming in and the income is X and you're going to increase the income by 50% through your value add, that's what a bridge loan is designed for. So there, there's a whole lot to do with rising interest rate environments, which we could probably talk for hours on, but, you know, end of the day, um, you know, would I be afraid taking a bridge loan right now with an adjustable rate? Probably not. I just got to make sure that, you know, there's that there's going to be money to pay the bills and, and plenty of it. Right. Um, my last question um, was, what were your thoughts on including electric charging stations and B to C class investment properties? Mm, good question. That is an interesting question. It's something that I've thought about. I, I don't see that working in anything but an A class property. I have a plug-in hybrid car right now. It only do about 20 miles on a charge, so it's nothing crazy. But I'm all about that plug-in car life. As soon as I get to a position where I feel comfortable buying basically a, a Tesla is probably what I'll get. Yeah. Uh, but a, a full plug-in vehicle, I'm about it. I'll do that every day. And I think if you want to cater to a clientele that has the need for car chargers, then absolutely go for it. I think that clientele right now and probably into the future is going to be staying primarily in class A mm -hmm. properties. Yeah, I agree. Class class C, I mean, we I own, you know, 600 units of class C. I don't think I've ever seen a single hybrid vehicle or plug-in car in any of those parking lots. So, it's the the electric vehicles are more expensive and it's usually people with a little more disposable income who are buying those. So, basically I'm saying the exact same thing Taylor did is a-class properties is probably an amenity that's going to gain you, you know, it, it, that's going to be appealing. B-class properties, maybe C-class properties. I, I say hard no. Anyway, we are about out of time. So I've got one last question for each of you. And Taylor, you get to go first. How can listeners learn more about you? Sure. So I host a three-day-a-week podcast to help the listeners escape the Wall Street casino and build wealth on Main Street by investing in real estate, the Passive Wealth Strategy Show, every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. I also recently put out a free seven-day video course on red flags in passive real estate investing. It's not everything that can possibly go wrong in a passive real estate investment deal. That would be enormous. You can't go through all of that. But it's the top seven things that I've seen go wrong or cause a deal to go wrong in a passive real estate deal. You can get that at PassiveRealEstateCourse.com. All right. So we have Passive Wealth, passive wealth Strategy Show podcast and YouTube channel. And say that uh, web address one more time, Passive Passive real estate course.com. Passive real estate course.com. We're going to have that information in the show notes for everybody. And Kenzie, same question for you. How can listeners learn more about you? Uh, yeah, so I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn as Kenzie Barrett. Um, there I post articles about the market, anything that I'm learning, um, or events that I'm attending that in the East Coast area that people can also attend. So Love it. Perfect. And we'll make sure we get a link to that in the show notes as well. So thanks so much to both of you for coming on the podcast today. Very much appreciate your time. And uh, this is a very, very fun episode to record. Thanks. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure to subscribe. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of Titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to the tribe of Titans.info. And we'll see you there.